You know, over the last 20 years being the pastor of this church, I've stood on this platform and I've performed hundreds of marriages, hundreds of ceremonies of men and women coming together in holy matrimony. And in those ceremonies, we have seen some very unique things. We've seen some kids that are actively acting up on the platform and playing around and the kids become the show instead of the bride. Has anybody ever seen something like that? Have you ever seen a, a groom pass out? Ha, that's always fun. Propped him up. You know, he's getting all nervous stand up and he's like getting all lightheaded and sweating all over the place. You just kind of relax a little bit. Weddings are very unique. When you see a little bridesmaid come down the aisle or you see a flower girl or a ring bearer and they get all nervous and they start wondering whether they're going to come down or whether they're going to go back or whether they throw the petals down or not. Weddings are unique. But there's one thing in every wedding that we witness. At the end of the wedding, after I pronounce them husband and wife, and I would say, you may kiss your new bride. They come together and they give each other a kiss. And then what happens there is everybody in the audience does what? They applaud. They're excited because they just witnessed what God put together. A new family. And what God put together, the Bible says, let no one separate a new family, a creation of family. Now, that may not make a big difference right there, but you wait nine months later, <laughs> two months later, 12 years later. That unity that we pronounce husband and wife as a family, they have some offspring. And that family has generated a new family. That day that they stood up, they communicated, they loved each other, and God put them together, they created a family. Now, sometimes those kids, like every family, <laughs> sometimes families can be the greatest, and sometimes families can cause us the biggest problems. Sometimes the wonderful, wonderful families. But any time that you have a family, sometimes there's pain and hurt that goes along with family. That old song, We Are Family. You know, sometimes we have to ingrain within our heart that this is family. You know, you have Thanksgiving dinner or Christmas dinner and, and, and Uncle Jed comes over to the house and, you know, how long is he staying? Well, he's staying three days. Well, he's not staying in my room for three days. You, you know, you want to stay at a hotel or you want to do something different because everybody has those members of that family that comes over and you're really not excited about it, but you have to deal with it. And you know what? The church is no different than your family and mine. Sometimes we can have the highest of highs and sometimes during the church you can go through the lowest of lows. You know, because if somebody doesn't know Christ, they're not part of the common denominator of the church. Because the body of Christ are those that know Jesus. And if you don't know Jesus, guess what? You're going to think you are a lunatic. They're going to think you are weird. They're going to think that you are hypocritical. And even sometimes just off your rocker a little bit. Because that's exactly what Jesus' brothers thought about Jesus. Jesus' brothers thought that he was crazy, out of his mind. It's found in Mark chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. It says this, Then the multitudes came together again, so they could not so much as eat bread. But when his own people, his family, heard about this, they went out to lay hold of him, for they said, He is out of his mind. He just told everybody that I'm going to heal the sick. I'm going to cast out demons. He told everybody that he is the very son of God. He told him his deity. And his brother said, dude, no. You're a son of a carpenter. You are not deity. You cannot do the things that you say you're going to do. They are going to kill you. They are laughing at you. You cannot do that. Remember his brothers, James and Jude, 
They did not receive Jesus and accept Jesus as the Lord and Savior until after the resurrection. This is your brothers looking at you, knowing everything about you, and they didn't believe anything that he said. But let's mark on down to Mark 3, 31 through 35. Then his brothers and his mothers came standing outside. They sent and calling for him. And the multitude was sitting around him. And they said to him, look, your mother and your brothers are outside asking for you. And then he said this. This is the church. But he answered them saying, who is my mother and my brothers? And he looked around in a circle and said to those about him, and he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. What he is saying here, he said, I understand the, the biological relationship. But what's more important than a biological relationship is a spiritual relationship. There's going to be a day that I leave my father and my mother. I'm going to be with my spouse and I'm making my own family. But bigger than that. There's going to be a day that I have a spiritual relationship with Jesus and those that are around me, those that are part of the family of God. That is my family. That is my brother. That is my sister. When you go to a third world country, you go to a different culture, and you give your life to Jesus Christ, you are putting your family in danger. You're excommunicated from your family. They may kick you out. The family is important. But God is saying the spiritual family, the body of Christ, has to be stronger because you have to be willing to sacrifice your family for the relationship with Jesus. Because the family is very important. It is that mark of God and God puts us together because we love him and he loves us. But there are some points in our life that we have to understand that Jesus is paramount in our family. And Jesus looked at them and he said, I understand James and John and mom. I understand that is my biological family. But I want to give to you a principle. Those that do the will of God, those that know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, those that understand what God has done for them, that is my family. That who is who I am spending eternity with. When James and John, after the resurrection, they understood who Jesus was. They were part of the God's family at that time. But right now, they're just saying, he's a lunatic, he's crazy. There's nothing he can do. So what are the, some greatest points about the church family, about, about how we are a common denominator, why we stand together, what, what can happen to the body of Christ that, you know what, it can get hurt, it can be misused, it can get... It can get um, Dirty and ugly. But when something happens to the body of Christ, what do we do? The body of Christ is not Glenville Baptist Church. The body of Christ are those that have given their life to Jesus Christ. They may go to a different church. It makes no difference. What makes a difference? Do they have Jesus as their Lord and Savior? Life's greatest relationship? Let me tell you who that is. The life's greatest relationship is Jesus. You, you may say, well, my relationship with this is more important. If any other relationship to you is more important than Jesus, you are out of God's will. God's will is Jesus first. Jesus pre preeminent. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. Religion will never get to you to heaven. Only a relationship with Jesus. Religion binds us to rules and regulations and to legalism. But a relationship with Jesus opens us up to freedom and truth, and love, and forgiveness. Religion, oh, religion is rampant today. People die, and people fight, and people will kill in the name of religion. And I understand religion. But what I love more than anything else is not that I am a religious individual. I'm a body of Christ. I'm a saved individual because of Jesus Christ and what he has done for me. When somebody says, are you religious? No, I'm not religious. I am a Christian. I'm a follower of Christ. But I'm not religious. Nor do I ever want to become so pious that I believe that religion is the only way that I'm going to get to heaven. Because a lot of religions do not point people to Jesus. They point people to an organization or to an individual. 
Religion binds, but Jesus sets us free. And I love this in Romans chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He did something for us. The reason why we worship his name, the reason why all of us are here today, if you're a child of God, it's not because you like the church. It's not because you enjoy Glenville. The reason why you're here today is because Jesus did something well within your soul. He did something to redeem you of your life. He did something to forgive you of your sins. He gave you hope. He gave you eternity. He gave you life. And that life is not because you're good. None of us are good. None of us are righteous at all. None of us deserve God's forgiveness, but Jesus gave us forgiveness. And that's why we are here. That is our common denominator. Not because we like the church, or we like the preacher, or we like the music. No, it's because we love Jesus. So, what is eternal life? Eternal life is just simply saying, knowing Jesus is eternal life. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Eternal life is through Jesus, not anything else. It's not a scale, it's not a balance. It's not if I do good or if I give enough money. It is only through what Jesus Christ has done for us and is the gift of God, lest any man should boast. And Paul, one of the favorite scriptures in, the, in Philippians chapter 3, Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. What is Paul saying? Paul was a very religious man. He was very, very religious until he met Jesus. He was an ultimate religious leader. And when he met Jesus, everything changed. And he said this, I have suffered the loss of all things. In other words, all my religion, all my knowledge of everything that I've ever done to get me close to God, I count as lost. And count them as rubbish, trash, an open sewer that I may gain Christ. In other words, we can't hold on to what we think is good. We can't hold on to our religion, to our knowledge. The only thing that we can hold on to is knowing about Christ and allowing Christ to take care of us. It is not about knowing the facts about Jesus. It's about knowing who Jesus is. How many of you guys have been to Abilene, Kansas, to the Eisenhower Museum? Anybody ever been to Abilene? We lived in Wamega. We had to go to Abilene once a year as a field trip. We went through all the, you know, as a third and fourth and fifth grader, it was a day to get out of school. We went to old Abilene town and had a fun time, watched all the shootouts. But there was a time when we went to old Abilene that we went into the Eisenhower Museum. And when I was three and four, for third and fourth grade, it really didn't make any difference to me. But when I started getting up to sixth and seventh grade, I started understanding who Eisenhower was. And I read all of the biographies. I read all of the statues. I read all the stories. By the time I got out of the Eisenhower Museum, I knew a lot about Mr. Eisenhower. But you know what? I didn't know Mr. Eisenhower. I knew everything about him. I knew what the book said about him, and I knew what the statue said about him. And if you asked me a question about President Eisenhower, I could tell you about President Eisenhower. But I didn't know President Eisenhower. And I believe our church is full of people that have a book that talks about Jesus, that talks about what he has done, that could tell you about Jesus, that tells you that Jesus loves you. And you could tell somebody about the story of the blood of Jesus Christ. Because you read the book. You've gone to the museum. You read the story. You know a lot about him. But what we have to be is not a museum that talks about Jesus. We have to be a relationship with Jesus that brings people to him. That invites people to the knowledge and the love and the forgiveness of Jesus. Not a knowledge, not facts, but a relationship with Jesus. And when we can have that relationship with Jesus, everything changes. It's knowing him, not in the head, but knowing him from the heart. The greatest relationship you will ever have is knowing that Jesus Christ loves you, period. 
Not a greater relationship you will ever have. Not more satisfaction in your life at any place. You cannot be part of the family of God until first you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Glenville is a body of baptized believers. What does that mean? We are all members of one body. And we are head of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the head of the church. And when Jesus is the head, we cannot be members of this church until we have accepted him as our Lord Jesus Christ. It is the greatest relationship ever. And then, what is the greatest family ever? There are some great families um, that have lived. The Bushes are great families. The Clintons could be great families. Uh, don't give me a boo here, but the Obamas may be considered a great family. Um, the Trumps may be a great family. But do you know who the greatest family ever was? It's called the church. Do you realize the church is the greatest, most powerful volunteer organization on the planet? There are more volunteers that represents the body of Christ than any other organization in the world. You don't have to be here. You don't have to work here. You don't have to serve here. But because God has given to you a desire in your soul to serve him in any capacity. He gave you the desire. He gave you the ability. And he says, here, serve my church. Not Glenville. Serve my church. Don't go serve Pastor Thomas. Don't go serve in the music ministry. You're serving my church because I died for my church. And my church... The body of Christ is my voice piece into the world. You're not doing it for your satisfaction. You're not doing it because you're good at it. You're doing it because I asked you to do it. And over the next eight weeks, we are going to come up here starting next week, and we have three or four different ministry opportunities that we're going to highlight. Over the next two months, we've had 50-some families join the church over the last few months. And... What we are saying to you is everybody should, everybody needs to serve the Lord somewhere. Not to just sit. Amen. Give me a applause. That's up to God right there. Everybody should find a place to serve. Everybody should find a place. It's not about me. I may not like doing this. You know what? Do you think Jesus liked spreading his arms out and being crucified? Do you think the sacrifice that Jesus made is easy? He died on the cross for our sins, and he's saying, the body of Christ, the church, is my voice piece to you. Our job is to evangelize the world. Our job is to communicate the love of Jesus around the world. We can't be sitting and souring and soaking and not liking and complaining. You know what? There's other churches that like doing that. Our church, God's family, what we are going to do is we're going to stand up and we're going to be called the righteousness of God and we're going to proclaim the message of Jesus Christ in the world and in these doors. Amen. Our brothers in Jesus, there's people in here and people in the world that just like Jesus' brothers say, that's crazy. You can't do that. You shouldn't do that. Well, when they see the power of and the effectiveness of Jesus Christ in us, they will see that the love and the forgiveness of Jesus can change your life. There's something stronger than a biological connection. It's that spiritual connection called the church. When you see that spiritual connection, you have to look at a couple, three things. And let's be honest. God's family is not perfect. Any, anybody? We are not perfect. We can be hypocritical at times. We can be judgmental at times. We can be opinionated a lot. We can have our way or we get pouty and we'll go play ball someplace else. God's church is not perfect. <laughs> kind of like family. <laughs> family is kind of like fudge. Anybody, how many ladies like to eat fudge, make fudge? Okay, Christmas time, everybody makes fudge. Well, I, I kind of look at our family... The church family is like a piece of fudge. It's really, really sweet, but there's a lot of nuts in it. <laughs> but we still eat the fudge. It's sweet. It's awesome, but it's imperfect. But what we have to do is a perfect church is never going to exist. 
And so we, we hear and say things that a church did this or a church did this or something takes place. What we are is what we are trying to do is strive to be who God wants us to be. And in that striving, we are still a group of individuals that are imperfect, that are trying to do what God wants us to do. But it doesn't mean that we are always going to do the right thing. What does mean that we have to always fail on the side of people. We have to always love. We have to always encourage. A perfect church will never exist. Mr. and Mrs. Cox is moving to Topeka next week. Um, Opened up a new store, and they move, they're moving there. They're looking for a new church. And, I, you know, and, and it's daunting when you move someplace and you're looking for a new church. We call it the church shopping mindset because there are certain things in a church that you desire and you demand and you want to have. So this poem is for you, okay? If you should find the perfect church without one fault or smear, for goodness sake, don't join that church or you'd spoil the atmosphere. If you should find the perfect church where all anxieties cease, then pass it by, lest by joining it, you'd mar that masterpiece. But since no perfect church exists, made of imperfect men, then let's cease looking for that church and love the church we're in. So let's keep working in our church until the resurrection. And when we will join the church that will be without imperfection, when we gain heaven's door. You know, the only way that we're going to be a church that's perfect is when we die and go to heaven. And our job is to know Christ. Understand that our churches can be imperfect. But here's what happens. God's family cares for one another in tough times. And I've heard many of you say this. You know, that you live here and, and your family lives in Las Vegas or they live someplace else and you moved here and you're all alone. Your family is starting fresh and you have two or three people here in Wichita, but everybody else lives someplace else and, and you're looking for a family and Glenville becomes not only your biological family, but it becomes your spiritual family. So when you are hurting, you don't have mom and dad to come to you. You have the family to come to you. You have the small groups to come alongside you. Sometimes the family unit is the one that comes alongside and cares in tough times. Families coming together in difficult times. And that's what the church is supposed to do. The church is just like our body. Now, I know that I'm a master carpenter. If anybody ever seen anything, you know, Tim, I'm the master carpenter. You, I've worked with Tim a little bit. But one time, one time I was working on this wonderful project, building my own house. And I was on the third story. And I built this entire house all by myself. And nobody helped me. And I'm lying now, okay? So, but I was, I was using a hammer. And I, I didn't know which way the hammer went, whether it was left or right or whatever the case is. But I was using a hammer, and I hit my thumb. Anybody ever hit their thumb with a hammer? There's, there's a direct relationship from your thumb to your mouth from your past. Amen to that? I did not know how that word came out of my mouth. I cursed. I got mad. And you know what happened to my thumb? My other hand reached over and grabbed my thumb. Like it was going to choke it. I didn't say hand grab the thumb, but that hand grabbed the thumb. I was I dancing, my legs started jumping, I was mad, my sweating, I started to pass out, I grabbed my thumb, and you know what my other hand made my thumb do? It stuck it in my mouth. Mm. <laughs> I didn't think about that, but my thumb was hurt because this hand hit this thumb, this thumb was not being used properly. But do you know what happened to every part of my body? Responded to my thumb. And sometimes the body of Christ is like our thumb. Sometimes something happens. Maybe it's because of us. Maybe it's because of somebody else. But somebody gets hit with a hammer. And you know what we do not do in the body of Christ? Is the same thing you do not do in your family. Well, that thumb's hurt. Let me get the saw. We try to hack saw our thumb off. We don't do that, do we? We can't do that. And the body of Christ is not like that. We do not cut somebody out because somebody is hurt. 
What we do is we come along somebody with a hurt hand or a hurt life and we come alongside them and we hug them and love them and help them. And you know what? Sooner or later, that thumbnail turned black and blue, but my thumb wasn't hurt anymore. Now, about two weeks later, my thumbnail fell off because it was black and blue. But you know what? I started using that. And you know what? After a while, that thumb was not afraid of the hammer. Now, the next day, that hammer was not the thumb's friend. But after a while, I could pick up the hammer and I could use the thumb to hold the nail to use the hammer. Now, maybe not the next hour, but it got used to it. And in our life and in our church and in our families, when somebody is hurting, when somebody is struggling... Our job is to care. Our job is to come alongside. Our job is to help, not to condemn, and not to believe lies, but to understand churches are imperfect. People are imperfect. I am imperfect. But we all love, and we all care, and we all work together. And then... I think church families celebrate. I think we can celebrate. Celebration is so awesome. That's what we're doing today. We celebrate with song. We celebrate in praise. We celebrate in worship. We celebrate in word. If, if a church becomes the museum, there's no celebration. If the church becomes the library, shh, 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 there's no celebration. But you know what? The museum... And the library does not have the cross. The cross of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ sacrificed and he died on, gave us freedom and gave us eternal life. If we cannot celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, we are dead. And if we are dead, why would anybody want to celebrate with us if we cannot celebrate and generate about what Jesus Christ has done for us? Jesus loved us and he died for us. We should celebrate what he has done in Psalms chapter 68, the father of the fatherless, the defender of the widows, is God in his holy habitation. God sets the solitary into his family. God sets us into his family. We celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and our Savior. The church is supposed to worship in the name of Jesus. You know, the styles of music has changed whether we sing with hymns or we sing with guitars and drums or pianos or organs, we've all had different styles of music and we all have different preferences of music and some of us like it loud, some of us like it soft, some of us like them short, some of us like it long. You could have a, a wide variety of what we like in music. But let me tell you what Jesus likes. Jesus loves the praise of his people. He does not like his people setting, souring, soaking, and mad instead of worshiping him. Whether we like a music, but you know who we love? We love who the music is all about. We love the music being about Jesus. We love singing praise and worship to what he has done for us. We may not agree with the length and the, and the vo volume of it, but what we have to agree with is the person of it. And that is Jesus. So let me give you the last one. Life's greatest goal. Life's greatest goal. In verse 35 of Mark 3, it says, For whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. God's will is mentioned 64 times in the New Testament. 64 times. God's will. What is God's will? Let me give you this simple definition. If you could have the mind of Christ, if you could have the knowledge of Christ, and you could take your life, and you could see your life 30 years down the road, and you see your life as God sees your life. God's will for you is to be who you are now, to be ultimately where God wants you to be 35 years from now. If you would see what God sees, the choices you make would be different than the choices you make. Because you know what God wants. So God's will is you praying God, Lord, what do you need me to do? How can I go? I know what God wants me to do. My job is to follow God's will to get where he wants me to go. Sometimes we feel like we're in the dark. Sometimes we say, well, I, I don't know what to do today. It's kind of like Johnny 
uh, grew up on a farm, and that was before they had the lights out there. And, and there was a noise out at the barn. And uh, uh, his mom says, Johnny, I need you to go out to the barn. So Johnny got to the porch, and Johnny said, it's too dark. Anybody scared of the dark when you were a kid? It's too dark. I'm not going out in the dark. So his mom came out to the porch and said, Johnny, I need you to go to the barn and check the noise. Johnny goes, I, I'm afraid to go to the barn. So his mom says, Johnny, can you see the well? Yeah, I can see the well. She said, go to the well. So Johnny said, okay. So he walked to the well. And his mom says, can you see the tree? And Johnny goes, yeah, I can see the tree. The mom says, walk to the tree. Okay, Johnny walked to the tree. And then she said, can you see the barn from the tree? Yes, I can see the barn from the tree. He said, walk to the barn. I'm at the barn. Then get inside and do what I ask you to do. And I believe that's exactly what God tells us. You're not going to be able to see 20 years from now. But you can see tomorrow. You can see the well. You can see the tree. Get up and do what God tells you to do. Get up and do what you can see. Get up and do what God has asked you to do. Tomorrow, you're going to be able to see the barn. Tomorrow, you'll be able to see something else. But today, don't not do what God wants you to do tomorrow because you're afraid of today. God's will is to get up and do. Don't sit and say, well, I'm afraid of tomorrow. I don't know what tomorrow has in store. No, can you see the well? Walk to the well. You know that's where God wants you to go. Get up and do what he asks you to do. And after you do that, God will tell you about the next step. But if you can't do the first step, God will never ask you to do the next step. God will only ask us to do what we are doing. So God's will never contradicts God's word. God's will never contradicts God's word. In Psalms chapter 32, verse 8, it says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go, and I will guide you with my eye. I will instruct you, and I will teach you in the way you should go. So, this is very simple. If I desire something, but the Word of God says, not, 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 should you do it? The Bible says, God's will will never contradict God's word. Well, Lord, I really, really like the guy. I really, really want to do this. If God's word contradicts it, you should not do it. That's how we understand the first step of God's will. Now, what God will do, he will send angels upon angels to come into your life to minister to you and to help you to correct every issue that you have. The heart of God and the mind of God and the word of God will go before you. But it never contradicts each other. God's word is solid. I love God's word. And as we sang and talked about last week, God's word is exactly who guides us. He's a, he's a, a lamp unto our feet and he's a light to our path. And then we have to understand God's will is always good for you. God's will is always good for you. God loves you. God wants the best for you. And sometimes our life is like a chess game. And you have no idea what tomorrow has in store. But you know what God has asked you to do. And be willing to do the next step or the next move. And finally, sooner or later, you're going to find yourself doing some things that you had no idea what you were doing. I had counseling this week. And um, I'm not going to tell you about the counseling. But um, you probably like to know about it. But one of the questions that was asked is about calling and about God's will for your life. And uh, I, I just said something very simple. I said, you know, others will see what you're good at before you'll see what you're good at. Others would say, that was good. Or you're good at that. Our insecurities are, oh, no, no, I bombed at that one. I can't do that. In, in athletics, at workplace, you know what you're good at. You come in first place, second place, third place. Everybody gives you the net medal. Everybody knows that you're good because you're faster, you're stronger. You can win that. And it's obvious in athletics. It's obvious at the workplace who is good at what things. But when it comes to your spiritual giftedness, when it comes to what God has given to you in your life, what God has implanted into your life, what God has gifted you in, 
You start serving him out of your gifts. You may not even know you're good at it, but you're not supposed to be good at it because God has supernaturally empowered you in it. Do you want to be good at what you do? Or do you want God to work through you and let him be good through you? I want God. And if God can work in us, it is not us doing it. We don't get burned out. We don't get stressed out because we know that God is doing the supernatural within our life and just say, I don't know. <laughs> it must be a God thing. I, lo I love this point. When somebody says, uh, did my wife call you this week? Because that sermon, you hit me right upside down. You mentioned four things that she was griping about me all week. I said, yep, she called me and I was taking the notes. And that whole sermon, I, be, I made that sermon for David Eagle because he needed that sermon. <laughs> because the Holy Spirit does this. He takes what we're saying. And he gives it and applies it into your life. And when you are open because of worship, that hard heart has been plowed to a point where your heart is open, the Word of God has come in and the Holy Spirit of God has implanted the Word of God and applied it to your life. And that's what conviction is. I may just be saying words. I may be blah, 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 blah. You may not, you may not even hear anything I say. But the Holy Spirit will come in and plant it and apply it and convict you of what you need. It's not me. It's the Holy Spirit of God doing what He wants to do. And that's what God tries to do. God's will is always good for you. God will always choose what's good for you in every situation. And the last point, God won't, you won't know God's will unless you are willing to do God's will. You won't know what God's will is. If you sit and you pray and you stand firm and you sit in church and you go to class, and you learn everything that you want to learn. You can memorize all the books of the Bible, and you can know all the stories. But that's not God's will for your life. God's will is not for knowledge. God's will is for application. And what God is saying is get up and do. And when you move, God will move. When you do, God will show up. When you start serving and you say, you know what, I really don't like this. And God morphs that into another ministry, another opportunity. But when we get up and move, God will then show us what he wants us to do. So often people say, I just don't know what I'm good at. I say, what have you tried? What have you tried? We have hundreds of new members that come to this church over the last few years. Our job at this church is not to be entertained. The job of this church is not to make you feel good about yourself. The job of this church is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to bring people to the saving knowledge of Christ. Your job of this church is to evangelize your sphere of influence. Is to take what you gain in here and to be the Christian you need to be out there. Not to come in here and enjoy church but to take church to the outside world. You may not like everything that takes place. And that's okay. I don't like everything that I do myself. But that's okay. What we have to do is we have to evangelize. We have to love. And we have to help. We have to do.